here and try to keep it casual. The world that I live in here in Atlanta. There were things going on in the community around me that I wanted to know more about. And when I would check uh, friendly neighborhood newspapers, I couldn't find much information. So early in life, I felt I had an obligation to tell those stories. And um, one of the, uh, a friend of my family was a noted Atlanta journalist, Simon Perry. I don't know if any of you have heard of Harmon Perry. He was a photojournalist for the Atlanta Daily World and then a bureau chief for Johnson Publications, magazines, Ebony and Jet Magazine here. And I consulted with him about this as I changed my major <laughs> to the alarm of my family. And, and he said, I said, I think that I could probably be of good service to my people if I became a journalist, if I became a reporter. So what's it like? And he said, oh, it's a noble thing, but just know if you're doing it for black folks, black folk ain't gonna appreciate you. And I said, whoa, what do you mean? He said, no awards, no pay, they won't appreciate you. So don't, don't do it for the appreciation, he said. So I said, OK, I won't do it for the appreciation. Um, and I became a journalist and immediately saw the need for a better process, not just on behalf of ra from a racial aspect um, in the black community, but because the processes that we went about in exchanging and disseminating information needed an upgrade because it was only reaching a certain subset of the American populace. So I dived in going after the stories that I knew were undertold. I became a reporter, an intern, and then a reporter for the Associated Press here in Atlanta. And on my first week in the job, I I went through the roller decks. So this is, this is tell you how long ago this was. Um, we had that big round roller deck. Who's ever even seen a roller deck? <laughs> okay, good. Then I'm not alone. I, I went through the big round roller decks, just looking for the phone numbers 
of the notable black people in Atlanta, just to call it and make sure it's updated. That's all I did. Was, is this number still current? Surprisingly, most of those numbers were still current, but there were a few that did need an update. And I said, I see now where I can be of use in this process. So I started going after the stories I knew, the people who seemed familiar to me because luckily we had a large population of notable and accomplished African Americans right here in the city available to be talked to at any time. I mean, my goodness, we would see Coretta Scott King in the grocery store. So I said, certainly I can tell these stories. I came in to tell those stories and apparently did a decent job because the next thing they wanted me to do was cover politics here in Atlanta. At that time, Maynard Jackson was running for re-election. Well, Maynard Jackson was running to get elected again to what would have been a third term as mayor of the city. And I rode, I took that ride along with these notable figures. Today, looking back at that era, it feels very, very historic. And, and I really was fortunate to have that exposure. It gave me the ability to cover politics, which in turn sent me to the Georgia legislature to cover politics there. And once again, I just dived in on the unearthed stories, the undertold, under-addressed stories. And they were plentiful. I didn't understand why, at that time, a lot of people in media felt the need to compete, because there were enough stories for everybody. At least I felt that way. I was never lacking a story. And so riding that wave of going in, digging up stories that were being neglected gave me a body of work that catapulted me from right here in Atlanta to Washington as a correspondent covering race and civil rights and, you know, also housing and urban affairs at that time uh, is what, that was the um, euphemism for those racial stories. There wasn't even much comfort saying you're addressing racial dynamics in this country. You had to say, I'm covering urban affairs. Um, I'm dealing with the state of cities and this sort of thing. Well, the housing stories were good, but the racial story <laughs> was bigger. At that time, Rodney King had been beaten by the LAPD, and riots resulted from that. And it was the cyclical cycle of urban riots that we constantly experienced here in this country, which set me on a path of, well, why is it like that? Why do we always have this? And it's short, in short, shorthand on it was, America had a very, very, um, small attention span when it came to addressing the issues that led to the riots in the first place. So the writing became cyclical. That led to covering an array of issues at that time, including the effort to mainstream Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, the dynamics between not just um, black America, but brown America, and the expanding population in this country the diverse range, the new multicultural reality that we had. Uh, all of that played out in the early 90s. And I duly reported it all because, again, there was never a lack of news in this area. Sometimes I felt alone and said, why am I the only one covering this? Uh, invariably, there would be three or four other reporters from outlets such as the New York Times or the Washington Post, but primarily those of us who covered race were doing it on our own. And we were also looked at by colleagues of all, all ilk as you're campaigning to be at that desk in the corner because that subject matter is not important. That subject matter isn't a way to build your career. I heard that repeatedly. You should go cover other things because race won't take you anywhere. You know, a lot of um, journalists regarded it as 
tantamount to covering the obituaries and didn't just consider it a dead end proposition. Well, our um, Washington bureau chief for Associated Press at that time was named John Woolman, and he had a different view. He enjoyed the work that I did. And so in 1995, he called me into his office and said, so I'm sending you to the White House. You need to cover the presidency. So I went over to the White House, OK? I, I, I mean, this is what I got into journalism for at that time, trying to do a better job of telling the race story in America. That was my career goal. And I was in my early 30s at that time thinking, I've, I've achieved the goal. Now, now what do I do? Uh, because I didn't expect to achieve that so early. Well, he came along with the White House. I said, OK, I'll go cover the White House. And the occupant of said White House at that time was Bill Clinton, who walked around with honorary brother status among black Americans. He had symbolic, he was a symbolic brother. He, you know, a lot of black people felt he really gets us, even though in a lot of his policies, he didn't really get us. Uh, but I said, well, isn't this natural? Why don't I just keep doing what I'm doing? Which led to covering the, um, national campaign for racial dialogue that he wanted to have, and really drilling down on his honorary brother status. What exactly does that mean? Um, you know, is it that black Americans wanted a black president so bad that they were willing to take any president who had, who had symbolic representation to us? And that was a lot of fun. So I said, well, hmm, I don't know when this is over if I want to stick around because what other president's going to do this stuff? And along comes George Bush. And I said, OK, I think my, now might be a good time for me to go and explore international affairs and global policy and things like that because I hadn't done much of that in the Clinton years. Um, that was supposed to be a snoozer for George W. Bush's term in office. Well, 9-11 came along and changed all of that. And what 9-11 did for me, aside from having to take me along on a very wild ride with the president that day, um, the evacuation for his safety was a plan that had been in place since the Cold War. And they took him to the nuclear bunker. They activated the pool that was supposed to go with him into the nuclear bunker. We realized that in real time, it actually meant that the journalists who were supposed to go with the president to his bunker were actually left outside by a tree. So no, we won't be with him on, the, on that. If that ever happens again, we know we will not be in there. And I said, I think I've seen enough. So uh, what 9-11 did for me was help me to realize the speed with which our country was changing. We always had felt that there was a day when we would have a much more multicultural, diverse society than we knew it to be in real time. But with 9-11 and the changes in attitudes and then the sudden exposure of Americans of Arab extraction, um, Americans who were Muslim, Americans who might have been Hindi but really were mistaken for Muslim or strange or foreign, um, was playing out in real time. Then along came some statistics that said, OK, you know when we said that year by 2050, America would not have a single racial majority anymore? Well, actually, it's going to be more like 2040, which prompted fear in a lot of people, fear of change, fear of the other. And this is the stew that gave us both um, the nation's first African-American president in Barack Obama and the more recent presidency of Donald Trump. So it turned out that having expertise and knowledge about race gave you the edge in this industry. It was no longer that beat that gave you the seat in the back of the newsroom. So I said, then we've got to do a better job of telling the transformation of this society as it progresses 
to that year where there is no single racial majority here for the historians of the future. How are they going to be able to understand the way this country changed if the media are doing a terrible job of documenting it? So at that point, I suggested to the Associated Press, this was in 2010, we need more specific, deeper, better journalism on this front. Um, since 1968, when the aforementioned riots happened in cyclical fashion from, through the 1960s and actually into the 80s and even today with what we see in Black Lives Matter, that cyclical rioting um, prompted then President Lyndon Johnson to convene a commission to explore these civil disorders. Why are they happening like they do? And that commission came back with recommendations that included the media being culpable um, in doing a terrible job of covering what was then called the Negro community. They did not treat black people like a news audience. Um, they did not cover the communities where black people lived unless something major went wrong. And they didn't have enough black journalists on site to cover in their newsrooms to cover these communities with a different perspective. So the media said, oh, this is terrible. We have to do better. And they ran out and hired a few people and created the race beat. And that's why a race beat was existing when I came along in the 1980s. Well, from 1968 up until 2010, the industry had been limping along with this notion of the race beat. And here is where I can kick in with what we are talking about here. All right, I hope my clicker works because I don't really know how to work the clicker. Is this a touch screen? No. No? All right. So bear with me here. We're going to try to advance. There we go. Did that work? Yeah. All right. I would like to share this quote because I always share this quote. I, I love it dearly. This was the editorial um, mantra of Freedom's Journal. And Freedom's Journal was the first newspaper in the United States of America uh, by, published by black people. John Rush, Rushworm and Samuel Cornish uh, said in their opening editorial, we want to tell our story. We want to control our narrative. We, the descendants of the slaves, we, the free, they were both free men, actually. Um, but the black people who are in this United States of America want to have a say in what gets reported about us in what was then the burgeoning American media. And this was in 1827, almost 200 years ago, that they made this case. We, we, we don't want to just let other people tell our story we want to tell our story. And that quote resonated with me because I was that child saying, I want to tell our stories. So Kerner Commission came along. They told the industry, you need to create a race beat, hire some journalists of color to cover the communities they come from and do a better job. So from 1968 to 2010, this is the mode that we were in. Okay, we've got one. We've got a race reporter, somebody covering civil rights, somebody covering this subject matter. And most of the time, these journalists would go out into the community, find the stories to cover, go back to their newsroom, and tell their editors, here's what I found. And the editor would say, I, I, I don't get it. Um, why is that a story? Or I don't understand it. Or I'm not comfortable with that premise. And what the general public didn't really know or understand is, in many cases, very viable stories were murdered in the womb before they could ever see the light of day on newsprint or on television. And there became comfort with doing things this way. We're going to have one reporter. If it strikes my editor's fancy, then yeah, we can make that a story on page 57 of the 
paper, or we can make it story on page one if it's really, really good. And most of the time, those stories revolved around otherness. Look at how unique and different this community is. Lots of cultural angles, benign coverage that was harmless. Um, in some cases, it just seemed almost like an anthropological exercise. Let's explain this ritual thing that this particular collection of people do. And when there was a fight to have truly significant coverage done, it became about crime. It became about pathological occurrences in these communities. And there were five areas, I like to call it CHEW, even though it's two H's in there. Uh, crime, <laughs> health, housing, education, and wealth, money, finance, um, the economy, however you want to put it. And the burst of, of focus on pathology led to coverage that said things like, um, Latino children do not perform as well on standardized tests as their white counterparts. Or African Americans have a harder time getting home mortgages. And it was built around the result of the discrimination of the institutional behaviors that when taken in the collective created disparities. So journalism or, or reporting and media were giving us the results without giving us the explanation of how it got that way. Because we're up against this, where the United States will have um, a population, a majority population comprised of people of other races, uh, and the current majority white population will slide under 50% for the first time since at least the colonial days. Uh, we, we, we've got to explain that. So if we've been limping along since 1968 uh, with just a limited process on covering this, how in the world are we equipped to do a good job with this? Especially when you consider that profile Okay, 49.7% of Americans, uh, will, white people will be 49% of Americans by 2045. And all of these other groups, including people who are multiracial or people who just say, I don't need to explain what race I am. In the collective, what does that mean? How do, how do we get our arms around that? Well, because your girl here has been playing around with this topic for more than 30 years, Here's how we can do a better job of covering race. So instead of just having one person work that beat and come up with stories built around curiosity, we need to put multiple reporters on that. We need to have the editors as aware of racial stories as an editor who covers, I don't know, who, who manages sports writers who cover the NFL. Would you take your business editor and assign your NFL writers to that editor so they can sit there and tell the reporter, I, I don't understand, what do you mean they won by a touchdown? No, of course you wouldn't. You would give sports reporters, sports editors. Business reporters would get business editors. You know, political reporters get editors who know politics. So it only makes sense for reporters who are covering America's transformation to have editors who understand that transformation. Some, some would say, hey, a good journalist or a good editor can wrap their mind around anything, and that is very true, which means that editor has to be willing to wrap their mind around anything. And in order to do this job, you are going to have to wrap your mind around race and how we live as a multicultural society. So we've, we've got to do that. We've got to take each subject that we care about. Remember Chu, crime, housing, health, well, um, we've got to deep dive into those subject matter and, and pull out the race angles and report them more thoroughly. And then we have to take off our lens of pathology. 
Okay, right, yeah. What do you mean by lens of pathology? I mean we've got to stop looking at people of multicultural extractions through the lens of how well they perform on tests or how much money they don't have or how, how they live shorter lives, the life expectancy uh, based on disease or anything that will tell the public they're doing, a, they're doing poorly as a population. If we are indeed doing poorly as a population, we need to explain how it got that way. And the only way to do that is to remove that lens of pathology from our eyes as we do our jobs. So um, on my journey, <laughs> and I was at Associated Press, and they said, yes, let's have that customized race ethnicity coverage you're talking about, and gave me nothing to do it with, but took many years of dripping water on the rock, and they eventually created a race and ethnicity reporting team and guess what? The industry followed. The dynamic that you witness today and the way news gets covered, it's almost impossible now to turn on the news and or go to your favorite newspaper, your favorite digital news outlet, and not see stories that involve people of color, the way our society is structured around that, and what's causing the situations or the conditions in which people live. So I have been at AP for a long time. Around 2019, I said, okay, I think uh, as I get longer in the tooth, it's time to retire. Um, but as I was retiring from the Associated Press, there was a story that was continuing to burn in my brain. And that was, I call it an uprising among black women voters in the state of Alabama in 2017 for a special Senate election between Roy Moore and Doug Jones. Roy Moore the Republican, Doug Jones the Democrat. And in that special election, Doug Jones was elected as the first Democrat from Alabama in at least a generation to the US Senate, buoyed by the black vote. 93% of African Americans supported Doug Jones and turned out to vote in Alabama. But within that, 93% core voters were black women. And when you did the math on the way the black women voted, Doug Jones got an outsized outpouring of support, 98%, the highest single support of any demographic for a political candidate. So that, that made me say, whoa, what's happening here? How are we getting to this? So, as I, since I was going out the door on the Associated Press anyway, I said, maybe, maybe I should start my own thing and try to explain things like this because black women were speaking up with greater urgency. And that led to the creation of Black Women Unmuted. Again, diving into the subject, pulling out that extra race angle and telling it with more detail and specificity. So earlier this year, Another pressing problem came along, and that is the way this planet is changing. Just as American society is changing, our planet is changing, mainly under the weight of the abuse that the human race has carried out against it. And we are now seeing the real urgency of doing a better job as as an institution, as the fourth estate, what we're called, which is our watchdog function in civil society, do a better job of explaining how we got this way, what is happening. And under the, under the old mantra of, good Lord, if white people have the flu, people of color have pneumonia, which means if something is serious for absolutely everybody, it's even more serious for people of color. And that told me, all right, Sonia, it's time for you to start figuring climate out. And Inside Climate News said, hey, would you like to be our managing editor? And I said, sure, what are we going to do? And there was a desire to do deeper dives on environmental justice in particular. What is happening with the way we manage ourselves as a planet that is making people of color more vulnerable to the vicissitudes of climate change. So I said, well, that's new. I 
down for that fight. So I went over to Inside Climate News and I said, like any other subject, the way we treat the environment and covering the environment, what comes into your head right off the bat? For me, it was tree huggers. Tree huggers and people who, who want to save the coral reefs and, and the ozone layer. And I said, I've got to get my education up because part of doing a better job of telling these stories is to wrap your mind as an editor around the subject at hand. And I uh, went in and began boning up on the notion of environmental justice, which is what happens in the communities where people of color live, where they're subject to landfill, they're being subject to pollution at a higher degree, lead exposure, uh, you name it, it's happening to us, where our homes are built um, due to redlining or segregation, and we put on a floodplain, and the, is there storm runoff damage that's worse where we live? Or who took, who took down all the native trees? And, and is that making the air bad? Oh, they built a freeway ramp right through our neighborhood. And now our children are more vulnerable to asthma because diesel trucks go up and down the ramp beside the house they grew up in. I said, that's a great challenge. I'd love to take that on. And um, learned about the environmental justice movement and, and discovered rather quickly that that movement, even though it is put forth through a lens that's focused on white people, there are a large number of people of color who care about the environment and who are active in it. So I said, okay, we're going to do some coverage. And we do this. That is what we do. And I said, to the staff coming in, we won't do this with a lens of pathology. If we see there is something bad that resulted, we're going to go in and find out why. And we're going to understand the science behind the climate change so we can say with confidence where climate change is exacerbating the situations. And What's more intense than wildfires, right? Wildfires have become a lot more intense due to climate change. So we went, um, one of our reporters went into a community in um, California. It's a very historic community of timber farmers. Um, black people who have migrated to this, it's a very historic neighborhood, uh, right near Mount Shasta. And lo and behold, the wildfire destroyed this community, uh, historically black community, near Mount Shasta. And we said, people need to know this and how it got that way. So we reported, reported it that way. Um, Inside Climate News is not alone in doing this and waking people up to this as is evidenced by this magnificent story, please find it and read it if you have a chance, by a journalist named Daryl Fears, who uh, actually worked at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution before joining the Washington Post, about a black community in South Memphis, Tennessee, and the Tennessee Valley Authority is getting rid of its coal ash, you know, the, the, the ash is from where the coal gets burnt to create energy. They're loading it up on trucks to, to try to come up with a more environmentally friendly way of getting rid of this pollution. And they seal off the cabins of the trucks so the truck drivers are not susceptible to the microparticles that can get into their lungs and make them sick, but they drive the trucks on open beds through black communities, and there's nothing these people who live in that community can do about it. Um, one reason the decision was made for this coal ash to be driven just 10 times a day, 12 times a day, coal ash driving right past your house, uh, this particular community was fighting a number of, uh, of uh, environmental battles, mold and flooding and storm runoff, et cetera. So this was just another thing that got added to the stew for them. And so when you are in a community where you're constantly having to fight 
for your right to have clean air, for your right to have nice trees, uh, and for your right to not have to battle off erosion in your yard that causes your trees to fall over, how do you pick your battles? Sometimes you can't pick your battles, as we know here. Um, this is a community in uh, California where they just flagrantly put an oil drill, a very loud one, within 25 feet of a family's home. This young lady depicted in this uh, image here can, has to listen to this day in, day out, right beside her house, and it's given her a whole lot of health problems. And then the, then the challenge becomes, how do we prove causation? How do we, how do we know that that oil well is causing her all those health problems? How, like, there's no true way to prove it. And it is a really bad dilemma. And this story by our reporter, Eliza Gross, um, was awesome. And Eliza said, it would be wonderful if the people affected by this could read the story because a lot of them don't speak English or read English. So we said, OK, you know what? No problem. We'll translate it into Spanish, and we will put it out for people to understand. And that's an editorial goal for us, where it is vital and necessary for people, for non-English speaking people, to have access to the, the knowledge they need um, to go about their daily lives. We will, where, where we can, translate it into Spanish for them. And if the good Lord is willing and the creek don't rise, maybe someday we can add an array of other languages beyond Spanish to what we translate about the environment. So this is how you remove the lens of pathology. And you don't look at the people at the center of the news that you're reporting as victims. You portray them as humans in the middle of a large process that came to them, not them going to the problem. So being a, 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 a local Atlanta girl, and hyper-local at that, uh, I often watch the local news reports and I read the local paper from DC. Yes, I do. I have satellite hookup where I can watch a little alive and Fox 5 and keep up with what's going on. And because of that, I heard about the gigantic um, lead contamination, lead contaminated Superfund site on the west side in the shadow of the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. And said, wait a minute, they built the gigantic spaceship and right next to it is a 600 acre Superfund site as, as in dirty pollution and it's going to take years to clean it up. Oh, we got to go and cover that. So um, one of our more enthusiastic young reporters who actually lives in Arizona said, I want to do it. And I sent her here and right over there on the west side to go to Vine City and English Avenue and talk to the people who live there about what it is like to be sitting in the middle of a giant cleanup of lead contamination. And most of these folks said, actually, this pollution has been here for generations, so why do they want to clean it up now? And I don't know that we can trust this process. And I said, OK, we have more than one story to do. So the result was a three-part series. It is on Inside Climate News. You should read it when you have a chance about the Vine City and English Avenue communities who are also dealing with mold, who are also dealing with stormwater runoff, who are also dealing with contaminated water. And oh, did I mention the Proctor Creek watershed, which is Atlanta's only watershed, the entire watershed sits inside the city of Atlanta, um, is also vulnerable to this contamination and pollution. And for all we know, how far does it go in this city? So we said we've got to cover this and talk to people, meet the people where they are and not treat them as victims. So we talked about, we talked with the residents about their fears about gentrification, that as much as they want to fight off any effort 
you know, to take, push them out of their communities. They still feel they're going to get pushed out, especially if everything gets cleaned up. So local institutions had to step in, like the church. Um, so there was a book bag giveaway, something really small that most media outlets wouldn't think to cover, right? Why would I go cover the back to school book backpack giveaway at Cosmopolitan AME Church? Well, here's why you go cover that. Because the pastor who is influential in the community and helping people understand what's going on said, lead contamination, oh, we've got to get this dealt with. Okay, test the church grounds. And we're going to have a book, give a book bag giveaway for back to school, so why don't you have your researchers come and talk to people about, from the EPA about this problem and what they need to do and why the soil around their homes have to be tested. Why those funny looking rocks that their children are playing with is actually lead and it had, may have lead in it because it's not a rock, it's slag. And you know, lead exposure is a bad thing and you might need to get your blood tested to make sure you're not vulnerable to the effects of lead in your body. And the pastor made a difference and the community opened up and began to trust the process. And so it was a much more layered story than there's lead contamination adjacent to the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. And we said, this is what you have to do. This is what the challenge is for media. And it's a huge challenge. So of course, biting off small pieces within subjects and reporting it more thoroughly makes sense. In a perfect world, if other news outlets were to do this and say, like, you know, you might have your ESPN, for example, they deal only in sports. But if they were looking, they, they actually do a decent job, but they go into the sports realm they're responsible for, and they do a deeper dive on the race angles within their area of coverage. If everybody did that, wouldn't it be amazing how much information we all would have at our disposal? And we as a society wouldn't have to be afraid of this transformation that is underway. So when in 2045, which is actually within a lot of our lifetimes, um, we will see the day where we have a truly multiracial, multicultural society. More of us will feel comfortable with what's happening, and we wouldn't be driven by our fears. So aspiring journalists among us say, well, you know, okay, I'm just a lowly reporter in the operation where I sit, or I'm just an intern this summer. What can I do? Well, here's what you can do. Here's how you get that lens of pathology off of you. The first thing you can do is ask yourself in your mind's eye who you envision on the receiving end of the news you produce. If you're out here doing a story, do you imagine your own mother or a guy you went to high school with or your cousin or a friend from fifth grade actually reading your story? Or do you envision, as a lot of journalism programs have taught for many, many years, that you should target the imaginary couple of George and Martha sitting at their table in Kansas City? And George says, gee, golly, Martha, did you look at this oddity that I'm reading about in the paper? So subconsciously, a lot of us think, OK, I'm writing this for white people. You have to envision people other than George and Martha. We're going to inform George and Martha, OK? But we're not going to leave out everybody else. Or we're not going to assume what race George and Martha are as we cover the news. All right. And we already talked about, yeah, you got to wrap your brain around the particular subject that you're responsible for to make sure that you're doing the most responsible handling of the facts that you can do. Uh, we are in a climate right now of dissemination of information that's actually misinformation or disinformation. And people become so focused on spreading information that they don't process said information in order to deliver it as 
fact, truth, and knowledge. There is a difference between just putting information out there and imparting knowledge. You have to make it part of your mission to impart knowledge. Take the time when you cover communities of color to avoid stereotypes, uh, anything that may portray people in a distorted way uh, beyond who they actually are. And do your best to avoid what I call success unicorns. Su success unicorns are those stories where they're meant to make you feel good about the potential of this person or that person. So you read about the 11 year old who's in medical school and they grew up in the projects and had a parent that was on drugs and walked to school through 15 feet of snow in the winter and just had this stellar genius and now they go to Yale. That's a success unicorn and as much as it's an interesting set of facts, it's also a bit of a distortion. And you want to report about success unicorns? How many of these stories have you seen where the only thing that changes is the age of the kid or maybe the national origin of the kid or, you know, but we've got all these junior geniuses in college. And how many people double back to find out what became of the junior genius? But they'll report the 13-year-old who just got the perfect score on the SAT and is now going to go to college. But do they go back when that kid's 15 or 18? And at some point, the junior geniuses of the past are now 30 or 35 or 40, and has anyone talked to them? So there's a way to deal with the success unicorn, but don't make that your only goal. And then finally, there's kitchen sink coverage. Kitchen sink coverage is just lumping people together just because. Minorities feel this way about the election. Well, there's a lot of nuanced opinion among different groups. You, you can't just assume that minorities say this. Um, polls are guilty of that often, but what we have begun to see with polls is an effort to oversample, to get enough representation of minority groups in order to be better able to explain the nuances within those groups. Black voters feel this is what's important. Latino voters feel that this is what's important. The Asian American Pacific Islander population has been participating with greater numbers than they have in the past. Indigenous people are up against this or feeling this or thinking this. Um, that's a good development and it should continue. But what should not happen is kitchen sinking all of those minority groups together under one assumed opinion. And you have to make sure that in delivering this information that you are not dumbing down or softening the news in order to make people who may be disturbed by it comfortable. There is a statement that's long been said in media. I don't even really know exactly who doesn't come to mind exactly who said this first. Maybe Mark Twain, I think. I don't know who, who they've attributed it to. but. It's been said that our job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And then they just leave that dangling out there. Well, the truth is people who need to know and need to understand should be given the information. You can reject it if you want, but that's not going to stop me from telling it because you don't like it. It's my job to impart knowledge to you as opposed to hand you information. So resist adjusting the news to make people who need to know it more, more make it more palatable for them because that some facts just can't be adjusted that way there are some truths that are hard and they have to know that that doesn't mean you have to put your fist in people's faces with with the news but you you can't run the risk of underplaying things that are important or things that matter then you have to, which is also the quintessence of uh, removing the lens of pathology, you have to frame it through the perspective, through the eyes of the marginalized, of the people who are at the edges. We manage to do that very well when we're talking about, oh, you know, the Tea Party or what they call Trumpsters. Then it's very easy to go in and talk with this group and look through the eyes of this marginalized population and explain how they're feeling. 
But that should apply across the board in a lot of ways. Um, I, I like to think that the focus that we've seen on the outsized and very vocal population of people who adore Donald Trump, um, that that is a good thing because we are telling the story through the eyes of the marginalized and not milking it for the, um, not milking it for the ratings that can come attached to that sort of thing. And then lastly, the best thing you can do, which is the hardest practice for our industry in these times, is follow up. I don't understand the lack of follow up. Um, but invariably, if there's been a story that's important to you over time, and you go back and Google it again to see what's happening with it and can't find any new stories that tell you what happened with that thing, that is totally a media failure for lack of follow-up. There's got to be follow-up. So if you're a budding journalist out here, you can build your stock and trade by simply following up. Even if it's a story you didn't report, <laughs> but you see someone else is not following up, then you can say, let me just go make a call and see what's happening with this thing. Um, good journalists follow up, period. Um, we are, just as we reported on that lead contamination in Vine City and English Avenue communities here in Atlanta, we're going to follow up. We're going to keep going back over there. And we're going to keep talking to people because that's what's necessary. And that's the way to do a good job. Now, if you're just a mem member of the general public and you're curious about journalism or you're on the receiving end, you're George or Martha, um, there is one thing you can do about understanding the urgency of getting a deeper dive on environmental justice and climate change in particular, and that is go to Inside Climate News at InsideClimateNews.org. Our news is not behind a paywall, and it is free to those who want it. We also partner with other mainstream operations. You will see our stories in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. You will see our stories on Capital B. Um, and an array of news outlets. And also, our stories are available on Apple News. So you can go there, and under the Justice tab, you can read all day about a whole lot of things that we have reported globally on environmental justice and climate change. The same is true for Black Women Unmuted. Blackwomenunmuted.com. <laughs> you can go there and see what we are reporting about the political and civic engage engagement of black women in the United States. So thank you for listening. And I hope that I have helped some of you have a greater understanding um, as news consumers and those of you who will be creating the news for, of the future. Thank you for choosing this profession. Do we have do we have time for questions? I, I'm, we have microphones set up. Okay. Sorry, okay, great. Go ahead. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. Then I'll start us off. Okay. So thank you so much for being a fabulous alum and coming and sharing all of your expertise with us. But I also was intrigued. So you know, I study aging, and so much of the pathology that you're talking about is how we talk about the aging population in the media, too. And so I was just kind of curious if you have explored any kind of intersection of age and race with some of the climate justice and environmental justice, sorry, that you're discussing. Not quite with that degree of specificity, mm -hmm. but it does come up, and yes, we are. Uh, we did do a story, one of our stories recently, for example, talked about Gastrointestinal upset reported among people in North Carolina who were affected by hurricanes, impacted by hurricanes. And what we found is disproportionately older people of color were more susceptible to those ailments. And that was, I think there were back-to-back -back hurricanes in 2018. And so a researcher went in and said, okay, who showed up at the hospital and what were they suffering from? And that was the outcome of the journalism. So sometimes we end up getting those, those outcomes because 
we come across them by accident. But invariably, they do surface with um, populations that are older, and that's when it comes to our attention. So, but we we do have it on our radar screen uh, because yes, people, older people, and actually two populations, both older people and the very young. And we did some reporting on the, uh, the extreme heat in Pakistan that was affecting both of those populations simultaneously. Extremely young people and the elderly were disproportionately impacted by the searing heat this summer, which is totally driven by, you know, um, climate change. Yeah. See, I broke the ice.